All right, I'm Dave Ratt, and I am going to further dive into the Midas M32 versus Behringer X32, and I'm um, just looking for differences and um, interesting things as I uh, mess with them. I have some time to dive into these things, maybe farther than a lot of people do, and maybe some of this info comes in helpful. You know, the digital versus analog mic pre's, um, differences in noise between the consoles, subtle though there. Um, today, we're gonna look at, at the consoles connected by the AES-50 ports. Um, I've got a chunk of um, 90 meter uh, Cat5e interconnecting the two. Um, they're stable, and I'll get into different cables in another video. Um, and I've got a pulse running. So let's go ahead. And I found something I thought was kind of interesting um, when running the signal over the AES-50. So I'm using the Midas console as the stage box and the input. And I've got a pulse um, popper running into channel one here, which is driving the first eight channels um, just set up from before. And then it's coming out the AES-50A and coming into the X32 and um, that is then bussed to the first eight channels here. Uh, and then I can, with the routing, drive the X32 either through the AES-50 from the M32 or I've also got a Y cable on this um, um, pulse output going into the XLR. So I'll be able to select between the XLR and the AES-50 on the X32. Um, and, you know, it's really handy to be able to plug these things in and run all those signals um, down a length of Cat5e. Um, I think it's one thing that's important to remember when dealing with digital and analog and all this stuff that I'm doing here that we do is that the perfect piece of digital gear dreams of being a short analog copper wire. I mean, just a piece of short copper wire has almost perfect response, extremely wide. It goes from DC to megahertz or more. Uh, it's completely flat. It's completely linear. Um, digital tries to emulate that and uh, minimize the issues that it causes like latency or um, ringing or whatever other uh, frequency response limitations, non-linearities. That said, the control that digital offers us is astronomically more powerful than a piece of wire. A piece of wire is what goes in comes out perfectly. Um, digital, we're trying to get what goes in to come out perfectly and maybe that's not the perfect, the highlight of what digital does, what it does, it allows you to min allows us to manipulate the signal and do all kinds of stuff: EQ, delay, split, um, um, and uh, various effects. We can do all of these things, and if we start doing all those things in the analog domain, it gets complex, burdensome, and um, noisy and messy really fast. Um, so six of one, half a dozen of the other. Depending on your application, some applications, it's better just to stay analog. Short piece of wire is the dream. On the other hand, if you got a lot of mucking around to do, digital quickly becomes a superior format. Um, so using the proper tool for the job, maybe not unlike a bicycle. If you need to go from your living room to the garage, driving your car may not be optimum. It's not good for the house, it's not good for the car. And it's not the optimum form of transportation between those two points in space. On the other hand, if you're traveling to Nebraska, walking, and you live in California, walking, although it's doable and it may provide enjoyment and a lot of um, uh, interesting experiences, it may not be the optimum. Here you're now you're looking at a car or an airplane. It's not unlike digital and analog formats. We transport, if you're gonna go a really long distance, Getting into fiber optics really helps us out. If you're going medium to long distances, then uh, you know going over Cat5 and going to digital and transporting is beneficial. If you're going a very short distance and you don't need to manip manipulate the signal a lot, staying in the analog domain is optimal. 
switching back and forth between the domains. We all hate airports. They take time. They mess with you. Things can go wrong. Flipping formats takes time, just like with digital, switching from one format to another. Um, so you want to avoid, uh, once you're in a plane, stay in planes, go to airports, hop through, get all the way to Europe. Don't switch from plane and then walk to the next airport when you land in a city or something. I don't know. If all that works. In any case, let's get to it. So let's get the popper going. Um, pop, pop, pop. And you should be able to see it here on the Midas console. And here I've got the gains matched. I've got the faders matched. This fader does not need to be up. Um, this does not need to be up, but it can be. Um, and we should have the exact same thing going into this analog board, out of this analog board, showing up here on this Tektronix scope. And you can see um, there's a pulse trace there. Uh, one of those is the this console here, the Midas, which is the yellow, and the blue is the X32. And I can offset those a little bit, and you can see the two pulses. And I can put them back on top of each other. And you can see that they're exactly the same or relatively the same. Okay, so that is analog running into both, using independent consoles, mic pre's, everything just set the same. Watch what happens when I go to the AES-50 on the routing here. So I'm on local now. I'm going to drop down to AES-50, 1 through 8. So now... This console is not picking up from the analog input. I could unplug that. I'm not going to get back there and do it. And it's picking up the signal through the AES-50 cable. Um, and we'll look back at the scope. And look, if we really look at this, it's looking a little different here. I'm going to spread this thing out. Uh, let's move this over a little bit. And look at that. Those pulses there have, uh, I'm set at 50 microseconds, um, and we're about one, two, three divisions, three, a little over three divisions, so it's 150 microseconds, so it's about 0.15 milliseconds, or 0.17 milliseconds differential in pulse time. Now watch what happens to that when I switch it back to local. And... They are still slightly off from each other, which is interesting, but they are very close. Um, I didn't notice that before. For some reason, there's a slight offset in the time between the two consoles. I'll investigate that further. Um, and that appears to be about 10 microseconds off, or 0.01 milliseconds. Um, and I'll switch this back again. And there we go. Uh, there are the two pulses. Um, it's probably not that big of a deal, but there is a slight delay going through the AES-50. Now, the blue signal, or the greenish-blue, is the X32, so we are seeing a slight a 0.17 millisecond delay. Um, let's look at something else. I'm going to... Um, put this back into local and I'm going to leave that where it is now. Now what I'm going to do is mute, I'm going to mute that and bring up this other one here that is running through a subgroup and then to the main. So let's bring that up and as you can see, running through the subgroup to the main, we have that point, well, I don't know, 0.2, millis, 0.02 millisecond offset. And if I go straight from the channel to the main and don't go through the subgroup by doing that, it does not change the latency. And I can turn this down so we can see which one's which. So there's one straight through and there's through the subgroup and um, and I've done some testing on it so internally in each of the consoles 
how I route this makes no difference. I don't see more latency for channels going through groups to masters or straight to the master. And that is great. We don't want different routing to cause latency issues because it'll cause phasey uh, sounds. Conversely, if well, you were to, for some reason, why a cable into a stage box and into the console and then have the stage box show up through AES-50, the one showing up through AES-50 would be ever so slightly delayed. Um, and delayed at, let's see, um, yeah, about 0.17 milliseconds. So if a millisecond's about a foot-ish, 1.1 milliseconds to a foot, 0.1 milliseconds would be about a tenth of a foot, so it's about an inch. Um, so we're losing an inch of, of, uh, of um, real world time um, by running through the AS50. Um, okay, let's see, anything else? I think that should do it for today. I, um, Really, I'm going to get on to the cabling stuff now that I got the AES hooked up and I got the scope hooked up. Um, what I'm going to do next is, um, I think what I'm going to do next, we'll see how it goes, is hook up an AES 50 between the two, take one of the Sound Tools cat boxes and put it in between and use that as a coupler. But that'll give me metering points. I can use those XLRs as uh, test points. And with those test points, I can see the various signals on the scope. It'll give me a good way to look at those signals. And I've done a little testing with that already. And actually, if I run long cables, I can start to put pigtails and jam garbage into those, not garbage, but plug like a little mic cable into the um, cat box with the Ethicon in, Ethicon out, those XLR breakouts, um, and dirty up the signal and cause the, uh, the sync to fail. Um, and I found out which of the lines cause it to fail and more than the others. Um, all right, I'll dive into some of that, and that should do it for today. Cool, cool.